Good afternoon. Uh, welcome everyone to the Georgia Tech Manufacturing Institute Lunch and Learn Lecture Series. My name is Billy D. Brown. I'm a research faculty and director of manufacturing education programs with GTMI. Uh, the Georgia Tech Manufacturing Institute is uh, one of 11 Georgia Tech interdisciplinary research institutes on campus, and we uniquely focus on manufacturing research, development, and deployment. We help tackle the grand challenges of today's manufacturers and assist partners in moving innovations from the lab to the market. GTMI has a wide variety of facilities and equipment located on main campus for basic research and nearby on 14th Street for more applied research in our advanced manufacturing pilot facility. Um, GTMI's mission includes education and workforce training, collaborative partnerships with industry, government, and academia, as well as thought leadership. GTMI hosts the Lunch and Learn series each semester. Uh, we have live online sessions at, on Mondays at 12 p.m. Uh, these sessions are excellent opportunities for Georgia Tech faculty, uh, students, undergraduate, graduate level students, as well as researchers, um, and a global manufacturing community to learn and share advanced manufacturing knowledge. To ensure a smooth presentation experience, all audience members are automatically muted. If you have questions or comments for the speaker, um, please use the question and answer panel. And I urge you to um, submit your, your questions as soon as you have them formulated, and our speaker will address them at the end of the presentation. Today, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Olav Lingberg, uh, who will discuss monoclonal antibody manufacturing transforming our most important biologics manufacturing process in, from an art form into a science. Dr. Lingberg is a senior scientific fellow within uh, advanced technology uh, group within the global techno technical operations and Janssen supply chain, which is uh, the pharmaceutical arm of Johnson & Johnson. He leads a group focused on mechanistic modeling process analytical technology and advanced analytic solution for manufacturing processes. Dr. Lingberg holds a PhD in chemical engineering from the University of Minnesota, where he studied under professors Rivens and uh, Flickinger. He holds a master of science degree in chemical engineering from the Technical University of Denmark, where he studied with Professor Jens Nee. Olaf started his industrial career in chemical development with Bristol-Myers Squibb in the year 2000. During his tenure with Bristol-Myers Squibb, he, among other things, pioneered the use of mechanistic and engineering-based modeling for small molecule active pharmaceutical ingredient process development. He also led an effort to develop and implement a rigorous FMEA-based process risk assessment approach, and he served as the CMC lead for several neuroscience drug candidates. In today's session, Olav will focus on monoclonal antibody manufacturing and its challenges as we transform biologics manufacturing from being new niche drugs to mainstays of modern medicine. And thereby, he will address key societal needs around access, assurance of supply, use of biologics, and high dose indications. In doing so, Johnson & Johnson seeks to address the relative high cost of manufacturing, the slow pace of technical transfers, the lack of manufacturing flexibility, and finally, to understand quality throughout the process. These changes will enable a broader use in indications with high dose requirements and better address worldwide assurance of supply. Johnson & Johnson seeks to accomplish these goals by developing more intensified processes, executing in modular and flexible equipment, while applying advanced process control and real-time release to ensure enhanced quality control. Uh, with no further ado, um, Dr. Lingberg, may, you may begin your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Billy D. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, it's an honor to be able to give um, this lecture. And what I hope to accomplish today is to, um, to explain to you why I believe that um, current monoclonal antibody manufacturing is an art form. Um, it's an art form because we use a lot of empirical data. Um, and we use this empirical data in a way um, um, 
that is maybe less science and, and, and more uh, simply proving uh, something, um, you know, once or twice or, or, or three times. So with that, what I uh, would like you to, uh, to, um, to maybe what we could go over today is how we could maybe transform that through the use of modern and advanced manufacturing to something that is more of a science and something that could better serve our patients. Um, uh, Billy just in, uh, introduced um, uh, myself and, and the, the group that I work in, the Advanced Technology Center of Excellence. So this is a, a diverse group um, that was created about seven years ago uh, with, the, with, the, uh, with the idea of creating more science and, and technology in supply chain, right? So normally, if you think about a pharmaceutical company, you would probably think of innovation and science and technology in the development space and in, in the uh, discovery space. But what we have learned over the last uh, seven or so years is that a lot of innovation is also needed in the manufacturing space to really drive our ability to serve um, serve our patients. <clears throat> so what we do is we provide deep scientific um, and engineering capability for all of our platforms, which are small molecule and large molecule, as well as cell-based products and, and of course now uh, vaccines. Um, and we have a number of different uh, initiatives, um, things like you know, the science standards for data, so we can use better modeling, advanced process control that we'll go into today, continuous manufacturing and modular design for both small molecule and large molecule, um, and then what we call process fit to plant, which is a, a way of, of um, making sure our processes fit the plants that we have, and then real-time release and smart tech transfer, which is you know goes to the heart of the agility piece that I'll cover today. And then finally, of course, plant design. Um, the vision for our center of excellence is to really enable our supply chain to become the world's most reliable, but also customer-centric and agile supply chain, right? By de de deploying these advanced technologies um, and process digitalization into the next generation facilities. So let me start in terms of talking about monoclonal antibodies, and, and I just want to start here, right? Um, I, I'm, I don't know how many people in the audience um, know monoclonal antibodies and how well you know them, right? So one that is a Janssen product is, is here on your right, it's Remicade. Um, so people who have rheumatoid arthritis or um, <clears throat> things like Crohn's disease um, or irritable bowel disease or psoriasis, right? These the people may experience uh, symptoms that can be um, alleviated by a monoclonal antibody, so such like Remicade, right? Um, it's a one um, monoclonal antibody uh, uh, among a group of antibodies that are targeting those kinds of, uh, of diseases. But as you see on the left, um, if you look at the top 10 uh, prescription drugs by revenue from 2019, you'll see with where I put those check marks, uh, quite a few of these uh, drugs are monoclonal antibodies. And, and of course, there, there could be many reasons for that. Um, but one of the reasons, of course, is that monoclonal antibodies are very versatile as drugs. And because of that, they um, have become, the, I would say, the mainstay of, of the pharmaceutical industry. Um, which used to be small molecule, but now I would say it's kind, kind of transitioning and it's, it's certainly more balanced and maybe even tilting towards uh, monoclonal antibodies. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, manufacturing of, of monoclonal antibodies and why, why even have this presentation, this lecture, right? So on one hand, you have from MIT, uh, Chris Love's lab, right, who's developing an on-demand manufacturing platform. And he's doing that to reduce cost and, and improve agility, right? And, and the idea here is to, can you have essentially um, a manufacturing platform in a hood, more or less, right? We also see uh, um, pharmaceutical companies like Janssen um, having, uh, looking at continuous end-to-end -end, uh, monoclonal antibody manufacturing. And this has come back in focus and it was really wasn't a focus for, for a long time. And, and so the question is why, right? And I, and I think you'll see later that it has a lot to do with cost and has a lot to do with demand. On the, on the other hand, you have um, somebody like uh, Brian Kelly, who's an industrial uh, industri uh, industry consultant who has uh, been advocating that really there's not that much innovation that is needed um, within the monoclonal antibody uh, process because we already can make maps 
I'd say fifty dollars per gram, right? Um, so so is fifty dollars per gram the right the right uh, number? And also, if is 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 that the only number we need to think about when we think about uh, making uh, biologics like uh, like uh, a monoclonal antibody? You have the Gates Foundation thinking or uh, saying that ten dollars per gram is 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 the right target and. And the question is really, is that is that the right target, or is it low enough? You know, as we seek to treat many more diseases with, with monoclonal antibodies. And finally, I, I want to uh, just kind of reflect on on the situation we are in now with COVID, uh, where we are seeing um, three to seven grams uh, of of doses of of monoclonal antibodies coming out of the clinic and being being put into uh, patients, right? Now, so if we imagine, I just took those numbers because these were numbers that was just in the in, in the news recently, right? Imagine that we had to supply two billion doses, like the two billion doses that Janssen is currently uh, working trying to supply off of the vaccine. Let's say we had to supply five grams of that, right? That would, you know, if you kind of back calculate what that would mean in terms of capital investment you would need in plant. To supply that in a year, you would need probably around five hundred billion dollars in capital, right? So, so clearly a completely uh, Herculean task. So, so thank God we don't need monoclonal antibodies for COVID. Uh, we we can we can use vaccines, but uh, but certainly a daunting uh, task uh, that just speaks to uh, how much potentially our volume uh, demand could could explode, and and what we and and and, and maybe how little we would be able to respond to such a thing. Um, so I don't know how much people are since, of course, are, are familiar with MAPS. So let me cover that and then also cover a little bit about why engineers should be interested. Um, so a monoclonal antibody is an antibody, and it, it's part of your immune system's adaptive immunity, right? So, so those probably a lot of people are familiar with this, right? But these Antibodies are secreted by your B lymphocytes um, as a result of an antigen challenge. So if an antigen enters your body, your body may uh, recognize that as foreign, and then the B lymphocytes, uh, after some uh, time, will be able to uh, secrete antibodies. And this then has a neutralizing uh, effect. Now, when we talk about monoclonal antibodies, we are talking about one specific antibody with an exact uh, amino acid sequence that is arrived from a single clone. Uh, and there are many ways you can arrive at these clones that I won't really cover today, but enough to say that a, a monoclonal antibody is therefore just a single uh, antibody that we have um, essentially selected for, and that's the, the molecule we wanna uh, produce. As you may uh, also uh, heard, um, there are many types of antibodies in terms of how uh, human and non-human they are. Uh, you have, it, you know, Kind of the fully murine model, this is a, you know, a mouse. And then, you know, what you have on the market is you have things that are chimeric, humanized, or even fully humanized, fully human antibodies. And these are just antibodies that have been humanized, uh, to more or less to, such that they don't form any other, um, adverse reactions such as, uh, as reactions from your own immune system to these uh, foreign antibodies. Um, when we look at an antibody and, and look at its structure, right, this is maybe a little bit more information than you uh, feel like you would want to cover, right? But if you look at an antibody, it's, it's consistent of a heavy chain and a light chain. Um, it has a molecular weight of about 150,000 Dalton. So uh, that gives us about 1,500, let's say 1,300 to 1,500 amino acids. Um, and what is interesting about an antibody is that you know, the, the amino acid sequence is actually fairly well controlled, right? And so as much as this is this would be an Herculean effort if you were an organic synthetic chemist to essentially make 1,500 amino acids in a row, that is not really where the crux of the problem comes from an advanced process control from a manufacturer. The crux of the problem really comes kind of here in the middle where uh, you have glycosylation, right? So glycosylation is a key part of the antibody. It is the attachment of um, sugar moieties to the antibody, um, and this determines um, a lot of this, the functions of the antibody in terms of its how long it, it will last in your uh, in your body, as well as uh, there are functions uh, of the antibody that are uh, specifically um, determined by by the right sequence of these um, 
uh, sugars. Now, the problem is that these sugars are attached um, post translation and they tend to vary depending on the culture conditions. And that is um, probably one of the major uh, issues that we face today in terms of making antibodies uh, at the right quality uh, every time for every batch. And I'll get into more details of, of, of how that then reflects on our, uh, I would say, our uh, manufacturing capability. So again, why are maps so relevant from a uh, medicinal perspective, right? So I think, um, you know, if you look at here on, on the right, I'm just showing you, right, I mean, basically Lilly and Regeneron was able to um, come up here in these COVID times with a new antibody in less than 12 months. Right. I mean, that is an extraordinary feat um, that I think is on par with uh, the feat of generating um, the vaccines that we now see on the market. Um, and why is, why is it we can do that? Well, it's because uh, antibodies are able to target uh, new molecular targets, targets really, really rapidly. Uh, we have essentially platforms, either in discovery and also for process development, that allows us to very rapidly take these antibodies and, and make uh, bigger quantities of it. Um, in some cases, you can have antibodies that have relatively low, do low dose frequency, maybe uh, once a month, maybe once a quarter. Um, so as much as antibodies are injectables, um, and some of these injections can come in, in the form of little devices, they are not necessarily, um, from a patient perspective, as onerous uh, as, say, for example, an insulin uh, that you have to take maybe uh, every day or maybe multiple times a day. So as much as they are maybe not as good as a, um, a tablet, they can be uh, fairly patient-friendly. Uh, you know, you can do self-administration. And the formulations can be stable enough that you can store them at uh, sometimes a room temperature, but often, most often times, uh, refrigerated conditions. Um, so if you just look at where antibodies are going uh, from a kind of a, a market perspective, and if we kind of reflect on that, thinking that that uh, market perspective reflects um, kind of the value of, of, of what these antibodies uh, are doing from a patient value perspective, you see that um, it, is a, it looks essentially like an exponential curve. And I think a lot of people uh, will argue that antibodies are going to continue to grow at a 10 to maybe 15 percent uh, annual rate in terms of revenue um, for the for the foreseeable future, maybe 10 years. Um, and I think that's remarkable in the sense that we, of course, are seeing things like CAR T coming along. We are seeing things like gene therapies uh, and other um, and other advances in in, in RNAs um, or DNA technology. But yet, maps um, continue to grow at, at this um, pretty significant rate. So, so what is what is really the constraint, and 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 why, you know, again, like I said before, why should engineers really care? Um, well, we, we kind of start here, right? So, an antibody is, is really made in a cell, and if you look at where we are now, we essentially have three cell lines that make uh, antibodies. There are, of course, more, but these are the three primary cell lines that that are being used. Um, and on the on the left, I just showed a. Chinese uh, hamster because the, the vast majority of, of, of maps are coming out of Cho cell lines uh, or Chinese hamster ovary cells. Um, and they have a productivity of about 20 picograms per cell. Um, and, and so that gives you uh, about 10 grams per liter in a fed batch reactor. And, and so, um, and, and it takes about, um, you know, 14 days. It can, be, can vary somewhere between one and, and, and 10 grams. Um, so really, the, the manufacturing facilities really, you know, starts start essentially with a cell, but that also uh, is kind of our limitation, right? So mammalian cells are generally considered difficult um, to to grow in the sense that they are low yielding, relatively speaking, compared to other, say, uh, bacterial systems or yeast systems, and their medium is complex. Sometimes you have serum requirements, and they are uh, thought to be shear sensitive. Uh, maybe less shear sensitive than most people think, but but certainly they are more shear sensitive than what you might find in a, in a fungal culture or a, a yeast culture. And like I said, the glycosylation is difficult to control precisely. It is really a function of the cell state as the cell is is growing, and that that leads to um, um, to this glycosylation that I talked about earlier being variable. 
Um, so let's look at a typical chill process, and I'm here showing you a typical uh, batch process, right? So of course there are uh, now also uh, continuous processes, and, and Janssen actually was a, a pioneer in, in, in continuous processing, but it really doesn't change too much in the sense that uh, you start with a seed uh, vial that is thawed, and you go through a set of uh, seed cultures where it's basically growing more cells in slightly bigger um, bags most of the time now. So these are uh, wave rocker bags. And then at some point you get into a uh, what we call the N-1 uh, seed reactor or the actual production reactor, and you inoculate a, a, a bioreactor of the scale of somewhere between 1,000 and 15,000 liters. Uh, and this is where you're planning to make your antibody. Everything you do from down here is essentially um, just purifying what you already made. And, and so a lot of the quality attributes are established here in this bioreactor, but of course um, the purification is, is nonetheless important to remove uh, key things like uh, host cell proteins and also making sure that you don't have viral contamination. And the way that this is done is that you take the cells and you centrifuge them, filter them, and you capture them on, on a column. Um, tends to be a um, specific uh, type of column called a, a Pro-A column that then captures the, the antibody and, and very quickly brings the purity from relatively low purity up to in, in the mid 90s. Um, and then from there on, you do a viral inactivation at, uh, at a low pH. You may have a couple of polishing steps um, and you have a biofiltration, ultrafiltration into the final buffer and then you fill it into uh, whatever um, whatever final um, vial that you want. So this could be for for the case of Remicade I showed you could be a, a just a, a little uh, R20 vial, or it could be a, a pre-filled syringe. Or it could be some other um, other um, uh, unit that that is uh, convenient for the patient. Um, now, if you look at this process, right, you think, okay, this looks fairly simple. Um, you know, I just went through this in, in about five minutes uh, for you. And 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 what could really, uh, what is really the, the issue here um, from a kind of advanced process control perspective? Well, what we missed to say in this is that if you look at the regulation, and and this comes out of um, of course very early days of of making maps, um, where less was understood. Um, in biologics, the process is, there's a saying that says the process is the product, which basically means that any change to the process is considered a change to the product, or, or said in other ways, that this testing is not sufficient to establish quality, right? So you cannot just at the end of, so you made a change to the, to the, to the process, you cannot simply test and say, look, everything is the same, and therefore I have the same uh, product. You will need to, uh, do more than that. So um, you would have to essentially uh, kind of revalidate and reestablish um, uh, you know, that the product is in fact the same. And in some cases, you know, and, and there are not so many, but this does happen, you may even have to do another clinical trial. Um, so the concept, so so that's of course a, a tremendous burden in the sense that, you know, if we could overcome this, so we could have a more direct way of understanding our product, you know, would speed up the ability to make uh, process changes and, and therefore be more agile. Um, the other piece is that the concept of GMP, um, and I don't know, good manufacturing process that is established in small molecule drugs doesn't really apply in biologics in that there are no non-GMP steps in biologics, right? So in small molecule, you tend to have maybe a 10-step synthesis and maybe only the last three are con considered GMP, the remaining seven up front are non-GMP, and everything that is a non-GMP space, you can innovate in that space uh, with relative uh, ease, uh, not, not without uh, some oversight from, from health authorities, but certainly faster. And, and this does not exist in, in, um, in monoclonal antibodies or in, in biologics. And so because of this issue, uh, again, um, you face, um, you face the need to uh, update your file if you want to make a process change. And, and here comes another um, significant hurdle, which is that different countries treat these updates very, very differently. So now if you're looking at something like Remicade, it's registered in, in, in 100 countries. Any change that you want to make to that process is probably like a three or four year 
uh, time cycle from the time you actually start the first filing uh, to if you have full approval in all those countries. Um, so can take away uh, the motivation to, to innovate uh, quite dramatically because if you compare that to say patent expirations and, and other competitors that might come on the market, um, the, the value of it, that innovation is, is, is of course diminished because of this. So the other thing is that, you know, as you manufacture, um, what I just showed you is, you know, kind of looked just at the, the material flow. What we are forgetting is that there's the whole analytical piece too. And often it takes us um, longer time to produce um, a uh, producer medicine. Um, sorry, it takes us a long time to release a medicine than it takes us to produce a medicine. And if I go back, um, you know, just one slide and go back to here, you know, this this last piece here is considered the, the drug product. This is what we call fill finish. Uh, so just from basically from the bulk fill to the final fill, uh, that is about a one week worth of uh, manufacturing, but it's an eight week release time, right? So you so uh, you can uh, you will spend eight times longer waiting for uh, to know whether that that last step actually uh, was successful. This remaining this this first part might be a a two months manufacturing, maybe a little bit less. And again, before you go from this bulk fill uh, to where you can start your final step, again, probably an eight week, uh, maybe maybe even longer uh, release time. So, um, so that of course creates a lot of bottlenecks, as you can imagine, in the supply chain, in that sense that you have, you're holding on to a lot of bulk. Um, and, and of course that doesn't necessarily help uh, any patient. It doesn't necessarily help any, um, you know, with any agility or your ability to uh, to quickly resupply the market. Um, and so the last part I wanted to talk about down here is that, um, you know, so to establish things like what we call business continuity partners, which are manufacturing organizations outside our own, um, can take um, quite, uh, quite a time, can often take several years, uh, maybe three, four years, like I said. Um, and so you essentially become captive, whether it's within your own, own manufacturing facility or within a partner in that you cannot quickly move from one facility to another. Uh, facilities have to be pre-approved um, and you have to, before you can get them pre-approved, you have to validate your process in, in, in that facility. And so when I talked about in my title uh, that this is more an art than a science, this is the core of what I'm talking about, right? So. If this was a science, we should be able to measure product quality in real time, and we should be able to know whether our facility is, is equivalent or not, right? We should um, be able to update our manufacturing processes uh, accordingly. Um, and of course, the release time would have to come down so that we are not waiting many times more to release a product than to simply uh, make it. Um, so uh, before I go into what I think are some of the, the things that I would uh, love um, universities like Georgia Tech, but others uh, to look at, you know, more from an academic perspective, um, let's just look back at where we were in 2009, because, you know, you can, you can argue um, what's the, you know, here I am talking about this in 2021, you know, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe the future as I'm projecting it is not going to come to, to uh, fruition, right? So back in 2009, there was some uh, excess uh, capacity and you know, was outstripping demand by, not by a lot, but by a reasonable amount. And, and projections were made that there would be plenty full of capacity because um, guess what? Titers were increasing. So we were seeing more, uh, more increase in uh, productivities in, in bioreactors. And so, um, but what, hap well, what happened was exactly what I just uh, showed you on the previous slides. As much as the titer has increased, these titers do not go backwards, right? So you still have processes uh, like our own Remicade that are running with the titer at which it was originally registered, right? So these are titers are maybe um, a quarter, maybe 10 times lower, um, depending on what product you're looking at, compared to what titers that you may have today. And the reason for, for this is that there simply hasn't been any ability to update it. So here we are in 2021. Um, there is no global capacity available. There is not a plant on this earth right now that is not fully utilized. Um, 
and and if you are looking to have new map capacity come online, you are looking probably two to three years out until um, the likes of Samsung and other uh, big CMOs uh, build new uh, large scale capacity. Um, and like I said, the map volume is projected to grow, um, you know, 10 to 15 percent a year. Um, and so I put on another product that we have down here, uh, Stellara, um, which you know I'm just kind of uh, placing there as, as a kind of reminder that these are real products. They are real patients who are looking to have have this. Um, and, and certainly in the in the age of COVID, we saw how how quickly uh, the demand for say something like what uh, Lily came out with for COVID, um, uh, you know, how quick a demand like that uh, can be created. Um, I think that you know these these type of constraints are um, are important and and something that we need to work on. Right. So so as an engineer, as a manufacturing uh, um, institute, what can we what can we work on that will really help um, solve this? Right. So I think we need to look at af af affordability, availability, the quality or quality control, and then of course patient access. And I think. If we if you look at those as outcomes, what is it that we need, need to hit? And, and there may be more dimensions than I just mentioned here, but I just wanted to pick the, the primary dimension of, of where I think we need to go, right? So for affordability, we do need to increase productivity because that is the primary way in which we can get uh, costs down. When you talk about availability, right, flexibility is, is critical um, because, like I said, the, the inability to move a plan from a smaller plan to a bigger plan uh, or just simply to another plan to, to, to scale it out is, is something that really could help us. Um, quality is something I think we need to have advanced process control to basically bake in the quality from the get-go as opposed to having this um, end of the process testing. And then finally, uh, patient access, um, which is um, in some cases um, is driven by localization. So the ability to produce in different geographies is, is also um, something that we need to consider. So I'll try to go through these um, a little uh, one at a time, and then we can, um, I'll, I'll take you through what, what I think is, um, is some of the choices that we can make. So let's start with cost of goods and productivity. Uh -huh. um, so there's, there's relatively little information out there that about what, is the, what are the cost of goods of, of monoclonal antibodies and what are the impacts of, say, uh, titer and other things? Um, so I, I picked up a couple of, of papers that um, that I could share, because of course it's always uh, hard to share any of that kind of information. So here's this one paper by Brian Kelly from 2009, where he's going through uh, three different scenarios: um, a large scale. This is about as large as you get these days in fed bats, 15,000 liters. Uh, some smaller scales at 2,000 liters and a CMO. And what he basically is projecting is that you may get to 20 grams per twenty dollars per gram um, in your internal plant, and maybe you will pay sixty dollars per gram in a CMO plant. Right? Um, and then, yeah, I think we can discuss whether this twenty-three dollars per gram is is uh, is something that um, that that is real. Um, but certainly, you could you could argue that. Um, that maybe these numbers here, I think, are a little aggressive. If you look at BPOC, BPOC has published data that would suggest that you know probably a couple of a couple of times, maybe say 40 to I don't know all the way up to 100 dollars per gram is a little bit more likely. And and if you look at CMOs, um, you know it, it's interesting to see that big big external CMOs are actually uh, often more expensive than internal uh, manufacturing. Now. Imagine, imagine I kind of adopt this paper, which is, is what I did. I took the liberty to adopt it to say we can increase this productivity to, to 15 grams per liter, which is about state of the art as we speak here. And what would that do to the cost? Well, if I take the numbers here, uh, maybe we could get the 20 to down to 10, but that is probably somewhat of an if because, um, you know, yes, you're increasing the, the bioreactor productivity, but there's, there's more to that than, than that. And then I would say, um, uh, yeah, so I, I calculated what that would do for the small scale. And the small scale, my numbers were more like 85 to 35. So it's certainly, it's certainly helping. Uh, but you have to remember that, uh, say we take the lowest number here, $10 per gram, um, that is 
you know, at the full production volume of this facility, so which, which now had just tripled from, from what we had previously. So that would be a 30 ton uh, product per year, right? There's almost no product out there right now that has that kind of demand. So it is not necessarily realistic to think that your product would be able to run at these, um, at these productivities and scale because uh, you, you would have to have sell off them to, to need a plant this way. And, and as you can see, CMOs um, may not actually help you out that much. So, um, so where can we go and, and what, is, what is it that we need to do, right? So what I showed you was we used to be down here maybe uh, two to four grams per liter. Um, you know, maybe a few years back we were, uh, let's say, eight to ten, and now we are having an opportunity space maybe plus 16, so let's say it's 15 to 20 grams per liter. If you compare how that looks, you know, from a fed batch perspective, if we want to go to perfusion, which is basically a, uh, continuous uh, bioreactor, right, where you where you perfuse the product, you perfuse a media in and you take out the antibody. We, we are already seeing much, much higher productivities, maybe as high as four to six grams per liter per day. And of course, there's um, tremendous opportunity in that. Um, but even then, when you when you read the the the, uh, the PIPA, uh paper that that also talks about this, you would notice that um, it is not completely clear that that reduces the cost as much as it might appear here because you're also paying for this with a lot of media um, and other uh, potential uh, uh, complications. So so this is definitely a huge improvement, but it is not necessarily a, a, a panacea. So, so what can we do, right? So I think what we can ask ourselves is we can say, okay, we are in Cho, uh, and Cho is a, is a good place to be. Um, from a from a patient perspective, it makes a very good product. However, if we want to reach uh, the next level of of cost reductions, we need to consider potential other um, other host cell lines, right? So it could be yeast, it could be plant. Um, you know, previous people consider goat milk. I, I just put that on as a, a fun old uh, old fact. Probably nobody's really considering that now. Um, but that could maybe give us another 10 to 20 uh, uh, times, uh, you know, increase in productivity. And of course, the cost uh, would be um, in, in the cost would be lower. But you would have to consider things like speed to market, installed manufacturing base, flat constellation, and activity as potential uh, downsides that you may have to navigate as you um, were navigating this new uh, cell line. Uh, now, of course, uh, there are papers out there. Uh, here's one that I'm showing you where people are trying to do uh, essentially what I'm also advocating, which is can you make the antibodies separate and then you can glycosylate it um, afterwards, right? If you could do that, um, things like a different wholesale line may become much more attractive in the sense that you could quickly make the, the antibody and to the extent that you had a, an efficient way of glycosylating it, we wouldn't necessarily be in this um, a kind of uh, <clears throat> a situation where Cho is good because of the glycosylation, but it's also variable. And then you have these host cell lines that, uh, different host cell lines that are, have glycosylation that is um, one less, uh, less uh, human and also uh, equally less controlled. So I think the conclusion from you know, kind of a um, cost of goods is, is really, we can stay in Cho and we can go to perfusion systems um, but we can also look kind of new, blue new sky, which is uh, host cell lines, uh, new host cell lines. Um, let me touch on agility and flexibility. Um, I got to speed up a little bit just because I'm realizing um, I, I would probably be a little longer than I wanted to. So, so what is limiting our map agility and flexibility? Right? Um, there's a couple of things. Uh, from as you go from clinic, you have a significant scale up factor to manufacturing, and as I just mentioned, scale up is something that um, Kind of impacting Cho and it impacts um, uh, the glycosylation often, right? Um, the, so it also, if you look at the, uh, the batch size, uh, batch duration, right? These things are defined at validation. So when you register your product, and so as you register your product, you your process essentially becomes locked in and becomes kind of uh, a monolith at that point, right? Again, like I said, the production units are qualified. And then, of course, I mentioned the regulatory. Uh, aspects I just uh, talked about earlier. And then, of course, the pricing, which is something I, I won't touch too much on. But um, but in some uh, geographies, if you update the process and make it more um, make it more productive, 
um, there is going to be a, a potential uh, clawback on, on pricing. So, of course, that um, can also limit that. So when you look at agility and flexibility, there could be like blue sky thinking about the new pl production platforms I just talked about, more plug and play equipment and modular plant design that, you know, we could, we could kind of think about that would allow us to be, um, but of course, these all come with the downside that I just talked about of the filing and kind of bringing up maybe um, more of the health authorities, not necessarily just in, in US and Europe and Japan, but also in other geographies up to this kind of um, thinking. If, we, if we're thinking within the current CHO framework, I think we could apply uh, advanced process control, which might be a, a medium, uh, a short to medium term, maybe not a very long term, but, but certainly a short to medium term that could really help us. And this would be real-time quality control, uh, applying of sensors and models, uh, and trying to make uh, our filing less site uh, scale and equipment dependent. So I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by advanced process control and where I, I see a lot of opportunities um, in just in the uh, in the near term. So so what what is advanced process control first of all, right? So if you think about a bioreactor, right, and I and as I mentioned, the bioreactor is probably the heart of the CHO process. Um, what we control now is uh, we basically have a recipe of set points, right? So we have feed, temperature, DO, pH. Um, and, and, and these, and a few of these things are measured. And then we have some control variables like gases, acid and base, and a number of other, uh, various variables. But we run this as essentially as a, uh, as a recipe with some, uh, kind of, I would say lower level, uh, or more fundamental process parameters being controlled, right? Not that these are not important, but just understand that this, of course, is not really telling you whether you're making the right product. It's more, um, telling you that you're doing the same process that uh, was prescribed previously. If you want to go to advanced process control, we kind of need to flip this on its head, right? We need to say that the, that the, the recipe set points have to be essentially a function of time, and we really need to think about what it is we're trying to do. And, and at the heart of a bioreactor process is to grow cells and grow uh, viable, healthy cells. So you need to understand your viable cell density, um, and your viability, your titer. And of course, if you can understand your glycosylation patterns in real time and you can control for it, that is uh, ultimately what we're trying to, to accomplish, right? So you need to be able to measure some of these variables. And I think we are getting closer, uh, but it is, we are not quite there yet. And we're certainly not quite there yet from a perspective of registering um, a process that is, that is run this way, right? We would still control as up here, we would still have the same uh, control variables, but we would try to control the outcomes of the bioprocess as opposed to, um, you know, kind of a, uh, just the, the local variable. So, so to kind of make this a little bit more tangible uh, for the audience, I went up, I went and looked at this uh, CMC Biotech Working Group, which is a, a group of pharma companies that back in 2009 came up with a way to register a product in, in kind of an advanced way using the ICH. Uh, Q8, 9, and 10 um, guidelines that the, the FDA is, 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 is part of. And, and the reason for showing you this slide is just to kind of show what are the type of quality attributes that we generally are looking at for a map and, and where are they controlled, right? So it's not a completely monolith, uh, but if you look at it here, uh, this first part would be the bioreactor, right? So that's where you make your products so of that identity, uh, your ADCC, which is your, um, which is your glycosylation, um, um, the activity based on, on your glycosylation pattern, um, you know, aggregates could also be controlled in the bioreactor. Uh, here, your oligosaccharide profile and your charge variants. I mean, these are things that you generally uh, control in your bioreactor, right? Um, so you, in this case, this, this map has ADCC, but it could be another uh, CDC, right? Um, um, so, so there's, so, so basically whether your bio, your antibody has its uh, activity or not it is determined in the bioreactor. And then downstream from that, you have things like host cell protein, residual protein A, uh, residual um, DNA, um, and, and other, and other uh, chemicals you have in your reaction. And of course, the bio burden, endotoxin, and viral safety is also kind of taken care of here. Uh, I wouldn't spend too much time on looking at what is yellow, sorry, what is green and, and red, but just to say that um, you know, 
this, this is this in this paper this was kind of the pre-work um, so of course they didn't have that many steps that were affecting that many quality attributes because that would probably be very difficult um, to to manage but if we now look at this and ask ourselves like how could we do better right um, I think the way we could do better is to say look at the bioreactor and look at the downstream processing what could be what could we do to get us closer to this um, real time, right? A lot of this stuff that is on the top part could be used, we could have inline or atline sensors, or we could have surrogate models, right? So it could be that we are measuring something close, plus a surrogate model would allow us to, um, in real time, determine this. And then on the bottom here, a, a number of these things can be, from your platform, can be validated out, or you can uh, show from your platform that it's already uh, handling it. So this is common practice, for example, for vial safety uh, already. And of course, the, the, the microbial things like bio burden and antitoxin are, are essentially standard to most biologics. So it's, it's not really um, anything specific for, for, for your molecule in this case, right? So I think what this suggests is that, or what I'm suggesting here is that there are, there, there's a quite a bit of opportunity to the extent that we build more models, we put more sensors, um, to basically start controlling directly the quality attributes at the place where we are manufacturing them. Um, so, so this is what I wanted to talk about for advanced process control, and I have just uh, another couple of minutes, and then I'll um, be ready for questioning. So, the other piece is uh, we need to have modular intensified plants, right? So this is a, this is a picture of uh, Janssen's most recent plant. Um, it is current. It actually has. Um, uh, completed construction, but I like this picture just because it gives you a better idea of just how, how big this thing is. This this plant contains four 15,000 liter bioreactors. Um, it cost, um, you know, about $400 million to build, uh, probably a little bit more. Um, and as you can imagine, this is a long lead time item, right? So this is not something you do uh, overnight. Um, and such a plant can, uh, can like, you can, you can start doing the math if you're making, um, you know, it's a 14-day process. You have four bioreactors. You know, how many bioreactors run can you get out of this? It's somewhere between 100 and maybe 200 bioreactor runs at, say, five grams per liter. You can you can do the math on on how much you can really get out of a plant like this size, right? So what we need to do is we need to we need to get to something like this, right? So we need to something that is much smaller, um, but of course also higher productivity. Because if we were here, um, this is this would be a plan where in one suite and in a much reduced scale, we could um, we could make antibodies. So nothing necessarily against having a large plant, but not all products will need to be made at uh, tens of metric ton scale. And so therefore it would be very hard to uh, be nimble and agile if, if all the capacity you have is at 15,000 liter scale. Um, so if we get more intensified, so higher productivity um, processes and we get more modular and mobile, we could envision a scenario where uh, you could configure your, your plant um, to make this product that you want uh, kind of through a real in, real out, which will allow us to make many, many more uh, antibodies and, and therefore be more patient-centric in terms of the, the medicines that we could, uh, could launch. And of course, something like this would have to be uh, more digital and would have to have more real-time quality uh, control. Um, so. Uh, so just kind of summarizing what we what we need to get do to get to these modular requirements. I think step one is to intensify the process, right? It's very hard to be modular if you have 15,000 liter bioreactors. Uh, we need to have a more simplified quality control plan so that it's so so offline testing is is much reduced. And of course, we have to have this modular equipment design, which is something we are currently lacking. Um, and, and then I'll just mention the, the advanced process control, real-time quality measurements that are that are key as well. And so here um, I'll wrap up and and, and kind of um, finish with just saying, you know, so what are the big bucket items for next generation map process that we that we really need to uh, to kind of solve to address, um, you know, address the I would say the customer need that is there, but even also address, um, you know other other um, other regions that may not be able to pay uh, 50 or 100 dollars per gram for 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 maps and that is really intensify our processes right whether we go to perfusion systems or whether we can get to new cell host systems or maybe it's a combination of both right we need to have more flexibility in agile systems right um, 
So that is the systems, the equipment, and the filings, not to not to forget, because these two these things go in hand in hand. And finally, the advanced process control, right? We need to leverage our data, our sensors, and our models. And this uh, actually works with the, the the filings as well, in the sense that a lot of times, you know, for maps, if you can imagine, one map process is very similar to the to the other one, but we treat them as individual. We treat them, as, like I said in the beginning, as as a as an art where we are not necessarily leveraging uh, the platform on knowledge that we have from one process to the next. And that then means that everything is kind of a, I would say a groundhog day filing, if you can call it that, um, as opposed to one where we where we leverage the science and the data we already have. And of course, at the, in the end, we need these modular systems that allow us to make many more different products than just um, the few that we make in, in most of our, our facilities today. And so with that, I'll, um, I'll, I'll stop and say, um, you know, as part of Janssen, right, we are in it, uh, until society's most daunting diseases are, um, you know, are treated um, and, and hopefully are in the history books. So with that, I would uh, like to thank uh, you for listening and, and I'll address any questions if there are any. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lingberg, for a great presentation. And um, yeah, we do have um, some questions coming in. I urge everyone in the audience um, to please go ahead and submit your questions. And um, I can start with one here I see from uh, Dr. Kevin Wong. He says, great presentation, thank you. Can you elaborate on the differences in facility aspects between a small molecule GMP lab and a regular GMP lab? Is it possible to build a small scale portable small molecule GMP facility, like lab on a track? It certainly is. Um, yeah, so I think a GM, I mean, GMP uh, is just a, a matter of having qualified, running qualified equipment in a qualified um, environment. And um, yeah, it's not a new, it's not a, it's not a uh, I would say a new idea or it's not an impossibility. So for example, it is it's not uncommon to have uh, skids that you can wheel in and out in, in say in small molecule labs and you can then qualify them on the spot and you can then make uh, clinical material that's a, that's a common practice in, in in the clinical space so so certainly the answer is yes we have another question from uh, professor Yan Wong he, he says uh, what type of quantities do you measure from bioreactors with sensors for quality control purposes? Yeah, so so that's a great question. So right now, um, for standard, if you look at a standard kind of setup, right, as, as, as process of five, now we generally measure viable cell, uh, cell density or viability, measures glucose. Uh, a lot of feeds are based on glucose. We often have uh, capacitance in there that's kind of a, a surrogate for, for cell density and, 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 um, uh, and viability. Uh, but we are moving towards more spectroscopic methods where we are measuring in real time titer and in some cases also uh, glycosylation, right? So these are, you can see there are people publishing these days um, uh, on, on those type of topics. So that is kind of where we're moving, but this is generally not yet, I would say, practice in a way where we file these processes like that at this moment. All right. We have um, Professor Todd Sulchik. Great seminar. Are the CHO CHO cells uh, considered clones and identical producers, or is there variability in the production of the CHO cells that uh, could be selected for producers? Yeah. So uh, generally, so the first, so once you identified your antibody, right, you have something called clone selection. So a number of clones are uh, identified, and each of these clones are are cultured in relatively small scale. And during that clone selection, you're looking to find a clone that has the best, <clears throat> uh, the best capabilities from a manufacturing facility, a manufacturing uh, manufacturing uh, um, aspect. So, so yeah, so we, at the end, you select one clone that becomes, then you make a master cell bank out of that, and that becomes your working, you know, your master cell bank and your working cell bank. But of course, yes, we have, uh, the clone selection is a critical aspect because as you introduce the gene into the CHO cells, some of them, uh, for whatever reason, 
produce better or worse of the clone. And the idea is to select the, the best clone. Yeah, I, I was I was actually just curious about um, the pre previous question for pre pre sorry Professor Yan Wong. I think we talked about the, the types of um, you know critical quality attributes that are measured, but he did mention like the the quantities. I know I guess it would it would probably depend on which CQA you're measuring as far as the range you know of, of quantity that you would be able to detect. Um, or are you meaning how how what what is the le the range the level in terms of uh, how, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I don't, maybe I'm not understanding the question, but, um, but so for example, in a, in a, in a, in an antibody process, um, you know, generally, so let's say it's a 14 day process, you know, it's not making a lot of antibodies in the beginning, but, but so in the beginning, you may not measure tighter if you, if you could, but then it, of course, it's, it's going from say day seven to day 14, it's increasing maybe by about a gram per liter. But they so you, so so you are you would want to measure uh, for tighter you might want to measure say, between half a gram to maybe ten grams uh, of antibody if you're talking about glucose right I mean most people want glucose in the range of maybe a gram up to five grams lactate maybe similar ranges so to the extent that you can measure uh, in that range at a say um, half a gram to 0.25 grams per liter accuracy. I mean, that is kind of the, you know, um, for those analytes, that's kind of what we're, we're looking at at this point. Mm -hmm. And I would say, <clears throat> I had a question myself, just um, for, you know, I guess monoclonal antibodies. What is a, what is a particular example um, of a monoclonal antibody that you guys are trying to produce? And, what um, what is a, a a critical quality attribute that would really help with manufacturing that particular type of antibody? Right. So, so a good example is a, a, a very recent, uh, not very recent, but um, one of our more recent products is called Dertumumab. Right. This is an antibody that is that has two. Um, so apart from having the the recognizing the antigen, which is what happens on the top of the antibody, right? It has this um, uh, has those black oscillations, so it has DDC and ADCC, right? So this is uh, cell-dependent uh, cytotoxicity, uh, and uh, I forget what ADCC stands for, but it's a um, uh, it's a different type of uh, cytotoxicity. So in order for this antibody to work, those two activities um, have to be, you know, correct, right? So it binds to your, it binds to the antigen as it's, it, as you administer it, but without the the CDC uh, and the ADCC activities, you're not going to recruit the immune system to um, perform the function that the immune system does as part of this. So we, so we, so, so a critical quality attribute for this their tumor map, and this is not uncommon from from for many other antibodies, is to be able to understand CDC and ADCC activity. Um, as function of time, right? Because those you have to hit those, um, you know. And, and if you don't, then your your antibody without a spec, and there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, you you can't purify it. You can't. Uh, you just simply have to start over. Got it. Got it. All right. <clears throat> well, um, I don't see any additional questions, and um, we only have about a minute left. So I, I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Lingberg, again for. A fantastic presentation. Um, and if, if anyone has additional questions, I'm sure they could uh, probably reach out to you, um, or you could, or you could reach out to myself um, at, at billyd.brown at gotech.edu, and I could, um, you know, forward the question to <laughs> Dr. Lingberg. Um, so, and actually, I just had one question come in. Um, are, are the sensors um, readily adaptable to the perfusion culture from the fed batch culture, or will new sensors have to be developed? Yeah, I think that the, the sensors are essentially the same. I mean, so from a sensor perspective, you, you don't really, um, there's really not much difference between the fed batch. In fact, probably this, it's a little bit easier for perfusion because it's a more steady state process. So you could probably target it a little bit easier. But I think if you can measure it in a fed batch, you can probably measure it in a, in a in a perfusion system.
Okay. Well, that, that uh, wraps up our time for this session. Um, uh, I want to thank you again, uh, Dr. Greenberg, and I want to thank our audience. And I do want to remind you, we do have one more um, session next week. And uh, that one will actually be from Manir Kalu uh, from NIST and going to talk about smart manufacturing um, with the NIST manufacturing test bed. So um, please join us next week um, at the same time. And um, everyone have a great Monday. Thank you very much. Thank you.